go. We are live. I am here with two guests that are going to be debating guns and the Second Am Amendment in America. I am joined here by Dr. John Lott Jr. Dr. John Lott Jr. is an economist and a world-recognized expert on guns and crime. Lott has held research or teaching positions at various academic institutions, including the University of Chicago, Yale University, the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, Stanford University, and Rice University, and was the chief economist at the United States Sentencing Commission during 1988 through 1989. He holds a Ph.D. in economics from UCLA. Uh, Nobel Prize winner Milton Friedman noted that John Lott has a few equals John Lott has few equals as a perceptive analyst. A second here. We, uh, for some reason, are losing the stream. Let me just see if we're, if we're live here. Hold on. Something's wrong here. Sorry for these technical difficulties here, guys. Oh, there we go. Uh, looks like working good here. Okay, it looks like we're good. All right. Uh, let's see. For some reason, it's not popping up on my channel. I don't know why. That's very strange. Um, Give me a second here. I just need to figure out what's going on here. Okay. All right. Well, it's it's there. I don't know why it's not popping up, though. But anyway, let me just continue with the introductions. John Lott has been one of the most productive and cited economists in the world during 1969 to 2000. He ranked 26 worldwide in terms of quality adjusted total academic journalist journal output, fourth in terms of total research output, and 86th in terms of citations. Among economics, business, and law professors, his research is currently the 28th most downloaded in the world. He is also a frequent writer of op-eds. And then we have Stephen Bonnell, a.k.a. Destiny. Stephen has sometimes appeared as a debate partner for with Hassan Piker, who works for the Young Turks Media Network and is the nephew of Cenk Uger of the Young Turks. Stephen, is Wait, how is that related to my introduction? Can, can you let me introduce <laughs> people here? Stephen is an American Twitch streamer, YouTube personality, uh, political commentator and a podcaster. I can already see where this is going to go. So, <laughs> well, wait, I just don't understand why Chank or the Young Turks is related to me in any way, size, shape, or form. Well, I mean, I could, I would, I could introduce you as a 30 year old gamer, but, uh, but you, well, know, you could, you could also introduce this guy as somebody who's like fake submitting studies before, but I mean, but I, that's okay. I see where we're going. Yeah. That's all right. Right off the bat. Let's we'll go, uh, we'll go right into so it. So, there you go. He's already, he's a fake submitting studies. Okay. Here we go. The, <laughs> in a, go ahead. You want to say something? Well, I mean, if Steve thinks something's been left out, he should be able to add it. Certainly. Okay, so moving on. Uh, in recent presentations and debates about guns in the Second Amendment in America, I have reviewed many different arguments, uh, and many of those debates, of course, included Stephen. Stephen recently begged me to bring someone on that uh, has a history of statistical analysis and all sorts of other things. So here... We For the are... record, I wanted somebody in that moment to demonstrate to you why your studies didn't show you what you thought they did. Okay, but... well, here's here's uh, here's someone right now, uh, Mr. Bono. So we're going to start out with uh, the link between more lax gun laws and more gun crime in America. We're going to start out with Stephen and uh, present your argument for why that is the case. For why what is the case? For why more lax gun laws equals more gun crime or violent crime and homicides in America. Uh, the meta-analysis that I was familiar with said that when right-to-carry laws were expanded in states, in the United States, it accounted for approximately, I think, a 13 to 15 percent uptick in violent crime um, in terms of expanding right-to-carry laws to citizens in the U.S. Okay. Is that, yeah, do you want anything more? Or? Well, I was I was asking about the, not just concealed carry laws, but also 
the more lax your gun laws are, the more gun crime you're going to have. Do you have any uh, any studies on that that you want to mention? Um, isn't that what I just said? <laughs> <laughs> well, go ahead, John. Do you want to rebut that? Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, there are dozens of studies that have been done on uh, right to carry laws. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd say about 70% or so of those find that uh, right to carry laws reduce violent crime. Uh, uh, you have uh, a couple, almost all the rest claim to have no impact. And then you have a couple studies that uh, go and claim to have bad effects. You're mentioning one uh, that, that study was done a few years ago, it's still not published. And uh, there's some real problems with it. We have a lot of discussions on our website with regard to it. But, you know, the main thing that they're doing in that analysis, I don't know why you call it a meta-analysis, what they're doing is, is they're looking at how uh, crime rates change over time in states that are adopting right to carry laws relative to some set of other states. And they'll pick Hawaii's off in the state that they'll use to compare to other states. And so if they say, Hawaii and this other state are relatively similar in terms of the pattern of their crime rates, up until the time that uh, right to carry laws are passed, we then look to see what happens afterwards. And if the other state rises relative to Hawaii or Hawaii falls relative to them, then uh, we take that as evidence that right to carry laws uh, uh, increased crime. That's not the way that the vast majority of academics go and do these types of studies. What they use is what's called panel data, where we're looking at lots of different states in fact, all the different states over all the years that we have the data available for, picking a particular state or two or even three states co to compare to one right to cure state at a time seems like a pretty arbitrary way to go and do it. And also, it doesn't allow you to control for all the other factors that can be changing after the right to carry law has been in effect. So there could have been changes in uh, law enforcement. There could have been other types of changes and other types of laws that were passed. Uh, there are lots of things that affect crime rates that you would want to try to account for uh, even after uh, the right to carry law has been put in effect. So, I mean, if you want to go and point to one study there that isn't published uh, that makes the claim that you're saying, that's fine. But could you um, that, just... Yeah, j just curious, so I can look into it later. Can you shoot me like like one or two of those studies that you say points to expanded right to carry laws decreasing crime? I'm yeah, sure. I have, so, I have a few you, here. I could, could you let Lot do it? Thank you. Well, ahead. if you give me your email address, I'd be happy to do it. Um, my email address, if you want to send me yours, is John R. Lot at crimeresearch.org. J org. J J O H N R L O T T at crimeresearch.org. And when I get that, I can send you back a list of studies. Okay, yeah, I put my email in this uh, in this thing. Do you happen to know, I'm not trying to like get you here, do you happen to know any off the top of your head, like the, either the publishers or the name of the study or anything, just so I could take a peek real quick? Sure, well, if I get your email right now, I'll, I can send you, uh, I, I can send you. Um, well, yeah, so in the Google, in the Hangouts thing, I posted my email address there. You can see it in the chat there in the in the hangouts and and just while he's finding that and and sending that uh there was a few that i was looking at before i've mentioned on my channel before there's one by gary kleck the impact of gun ownership rates on crime well, rates. Gary, gary's not doing the types of studies that he's talking about there okay i mean we can go and talk about gary stuff right no I, just, I don't know what to, i don't know what to, you say it's in google hangout i don't know Oh, sorry. So on the window where we are talking, I think on right. the right side, there should be, um, there's a way that you can open like a chat. I'm not entirely sure how. Well, if you tell uh, me how to do it. Yeah, there should be I, a... Right. Oh, on the top left, there's like a little on blue box. You can click that. There's a blue box at the bottom, chat. Maybe. Right. And uh, I could just send you his email too, by the way. I could email too. Well, I just, I just gave you a link. And uh... there you go. You can just link it right in the chat. 
But yeah, there was one from Gary Kleck that's, that uh, I was looking at earlier, the results of this particular study. It was found that most studies did not solve any of the problems that you need to solve in order to study uh, gun ownership rates and crime rates. It says that the research did a, the research that did a better job of addressing these problems was less likely to support the more guns cause more crime hypothesis. Indeed, none of the studies that solved all three problems supported this hypothesis. There was another one I was looking at in regards to gun ownership and, uh, let's see, gun, the impact of gun control and gun ownership levels on violence rates. This was by uh, Britt Patterson and also Gary Kleck. This, the abstract of this was what effects do gun, it was the gun prevalence levels generally have no net positive effect on total violence rates. Number two, homicide, gun assault, and, and rape rates increase gun prevalence. Uh, right. Number three. Okay. None of those deal with what he's talking about here. I mean, we can yeah. be happy to talk. Well, about okay. It. Let me see I the just, ones that you, you linked here. Did you get the link here. that I sent you, Steve? What, I'm you sorry. Get, what did you say, John? Did you get the link I sent you? I sent, I did the talk, the chat box. I sent you three. Oh, yeah, yeah. I said, I said. Gotcha. But the first link is probably the most relevant. There's a few dozen studies that are linked there. They're published in journals from the Journal of Law and Economics, Journal of Legal Studies, Criminology Journals, other types of journals that are there, uh, uh, Economic Inquiry, uh, many academic peer-reviewed journals are there. Okay, gotcha. Yep, okay, I've got these recorded. Um, what, what, other, uh, what other claims, I guess, do you make in, in regards to firearm ownership, like in terms of like effect on suicides or anything like that? Well, uh, Nobody that I know has found that concealed handgun laws are related to suicide rates in any way. Sure, There's so no... not concealed handgun laws, but maybe expanding like the ability to acquire weapons or, or making some types of gun control like more lax in some states at all. Is there is there do you think there's any correlation there? Like if it's easier to acquire a firearm in some state versus another, do you think that that leads more people to commit suicide with said firearms or like having a firearm in the house leads people to commit suicide with them or no? Right. Okay, there's two broad types of studies. There, mm -hmm. there are studies by economists and criminologists, and then there are studies by public health people. Okay. The studies by economists and criminologists don't find a relationship between gun ownership and suicides. The studies by public health people generally do. And there's a couple different types of studies by public health people, and I can explain to you why they're making mistakes that cause them to go and find the relationships that they claim to occur. So probably the most famous studies about by public health people are by a guy named uh, Arthur Kellerman, mm -hmm. who talks about the risk of having a gun in the home. And what he what he did, and this is used many times in public health research, is to look at people who died in or near residence over the course of a year, and ask the relatives of the deceased whether the person owned a gun, and then they assume that if somebody owned a gun and the person in the residence died from a gunshot, then it was that gun that was used in the death, whether it be uh, suicide or be something else. Um, what you find is that when people have looked at the data, that about 86% of the deaths, when you're including suicides as well as homicides, are due to a weapon that is brought in from the outside. Uh, just fixing that by only counting deaths based on whether the gun was actually in the home was the one that was used in the death, reverses the results. But there's a more critical problem that occurs with those. And that is, so you have the people who died in or near residence and asking their relatives whether or not they owned a gun. And then they have a control group of people who are the same age, sex, and race who live within a mile of the deceased and ask them whether they own a gun. And then they essentially run a regression on whether you die based on whether uh, you own a gun. And they find a positive relationship. But let me give you a simple example. Let's say we were to apply that logic to hospital care. And we're going to go and look to see whether uh, we find people in a city over a course of a year who have died. We ask their relatives whether they've been to a hospital. And then we have a control group of people who are the same age, sex, and race who live within a mile of the deceased and ask them whether they've been to the hospital. And then we run a regression on whether you went to the hospital, whether you died. My guess is you'd find a very strong relationship there. Does that mean we should go and lobby against hospitals? Probably not. Because 
The point here is that there's a reason why certain people went to the hospital. People who were sick went to the hospital. People who weren't sick didn't go to the hospital. And people who are sick enough to go to the hospital are more likely to die than people who weren't sick. And so you have an issue here. Why do some certain people own guns? Maybe they own guns because their house had been broken into multiple times in the past. Maybe they owned a gun because they were a member of a gang. And so if you took away their gun, they may even have an even higher probability of dying. But just in the, in the hospital case, you want to have two people who are equally sick, one who went to the hospital and one who didn't, to see whether or not that affected their probability of dying. You understand? And the way an economist would look at that is to say, what happens if I made it more costly for somebody to go to the hospital? So somebody who was previously going to the hospital now isn't going to be able to go to the hospital. What happens to their probability of dying? And so there's prices there or costs that allow you to try to sort out two equally sick people. That's not the way public health people do this. What they do is they use tests that they've used for testing the efficacy of drugs. But there's a big difference between testing social phenomena and testing the efficacy of drugs. The big difference is, is that when you're testing drugs, I determine whether or not you have the placebo or whether you have the real drug. It's a random trial that's there. To do that in a social setting is I would have to make you own a gun whether you want to own a gun or not, or keep you from owning a gun whether you want to own a gun or not. That's not the way social experiments generally are set up to work. And, and there's a real problem using the type of methodology that public health people do for testing drugs than it is for testing uh, other things. To be fair, that Destiny. kind of study could never be done with the social sciences, right? We, we can't really ethically do stuff like that. Do Yeah, well... We can't compel we somebody to own a firearm, right, or something like that. Also, yeah, I'm not entirely sure if I agree with the hospital comparison to the to the gun comparison, although I kind of understand where you're going. Um, I'm sorry, what were you saying, Vince? No, I was just going to say, do you want to have a do you want to say something? Uh, no, I'm just listening right now. I'm just collecting uh, information. Um, okay, how do you feel about self-defense gun use? Do you feel like um, do you feel like self-defense gun use is a positive thing? Do you think it leads to better outcomes generally than either using other tools or not having a gun for self-defense use? No, I don't even think it's close. Uh, you have the National Crime Victimization Survey, which has surveyed people, uh, 100,000 people a year for over 40 years. And they have incredibly detailed breakdowns about what type of crime was being committed, where it was being committed, the nature of the victim who was uh -huh. there, as well as the criminal. Uh, and you have detailed data on many different types of ways people respond. Do they behave passively? Do they try to run away? Do they use a baseball bat, mace, a knife, a gun, a stun gun? Uh -huh. And what you find is that, uh, particularly for women and the elderly, Using a gun is by far the safe course of action for people to take when they're confronting a criminal by themselves. For that, um, so comparing the use of a, like a firearm to another tool, do you know of any studies that compare those two things? Because the ones that I'm familiar with, or at least the one that I'm familiar with, shows that using a handgun um, seems to lead to worse outcomes than using other tools, at least in regards to property crime. Well, or we can look property crime. Uh, the National Crime Victimization Survey is usually used for breaking down violent crime okay. type outcomes. And, uh, you know, it's pretty clear. I mean, you take women, for example, mm -hmm. uh, by far the most dangerous course of action for women to take when they're confronted by a criminal is to use your fists or to yell or scream. Sure. Uh, running away is also very dangerous. Uh, but even using a baseball bat or mace is not, mace is about uh, the same as passive behavior. What people often do is they lump together all forms of active resistance together and compare that to passive behavior. And in that case, active resistance is more dangerous than passive behavior. But the problem is, is that you're lumping together some things that are much more dangerous than passive behavior and, and guns, which are by far the safest course. Women who behave passively are about 2.4 times more likely to end up being seriously injured than men. 
you know, you look at stun gun or mace, for example. Wait, so I'm just curious, just on that. So if I could have, like, is there is there a study where they compare, like, um, self-defense case uses um, of, like, say, using another tool or a yeah. bat or a stun gun or something versus, like, a firearm right. that shows, like, a successful outcome or, like, a prevention yes. of either injury or rape or property loss or whatever. Right. Has that been done by the National Victimization Survey? Do they account for all of that in there? or? Yes. I mean, there are a number of papers on that. Uh, uh, Vince was mentioning Gary Kleck. That's probably what Gary Kleck's probably best known for is. How do you spell uh, his last name? He's K written in L E C K. And just, A L no Gary K, 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 K L E C K. And just okay. on the suicide thing, there was a study done by, and I don't know if you've either either of you have heard about this. This is published by Oxford University uh, on behalf of John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. For gun laws and suicides, this is by the Department. Actually, it's, I'm sorry, it's the author information, Department of Economics, Boston College. Uh, in the data, they say, this is the abstract, 25 states, and I linked this in the chat as well. In the data, 25 states strengthened gun, gun control by an average of six points. Such an increase may result in something like a 3.3% decrease in firearm suicides, but... No impact on non-firearm suicides was found overall. Oh, well, it says, while no impact on non-firearm -suic non suicides was found overall, interacted models showed an increase in non-firearm suicides among black males, white and black females, and older individuals. Strengthening gun control may reduce firearm suicides overall, but may increase non-firearm suicides in some populations. Results advocate... So basically, it's saying that the very, very small percentages, if anything, uh, on the effect. Yeah, of you, I noticed you stopped reading that last sentence. I'll, I'll read it for you. Results advocate for stricter gun laws and additional policies are needed for populations who shifted for non-firearm suicides. I don't know why you admitted that last sentence. Right. Well, I just had this is the part that I have I, highlighted, but it's saying mm -hmm. that there's there's. Well, you says, literally stopped no reading impact, when I said it. While no impact on non-firearm suicides was found overall, interactive models showed an increase in non-firearm suicides among black males. And that was the point I was making in our last debate, uh, basically saying that they would just use something else. And so, um, again, this is the study that I found, but I don't know if you guys want to comment on that. Uh, is, this, is this the study by Siegel? Is this the one where they go and they lump together all the different types of gun control laws and have a count on the total number of gun yeah, control that, laws? Yeah, it says, yeah, okay. there's a IR okay, so here, articles, right. right? the gun control increase by six points. Right, right. okay. So <clears throat> here's the deal, and that is um, there are lots of problems with this. One is to me, you want to run a regression with total suicide deaths, okay? Because uh, there's issues of substitutability. And my guess is if they had done that, they wouldn't have found any statistically significant result that was there. Uh, you know, if they switch, and it's the question of in total, does the total significantly change or not? You know, the fact that they find for some subgroups it may increase for non firearm that's interesting. But the question is, what happens when I add everything together? In, in looking at the total. The other thing is, you know, it's another example of public health type studies. Uh, it makes no sense to me just to go and lump together all the different types of gun control laws. Uh, it's arbitrary which ones they include. Uh, you know, for example, they include things like concealed carry, where they say they count as a law whether or not you have a background check when you get your permit renewed. Maybe that's important. I don't know. But they don't include, for example, whether you require training to be able to go and get a concealed carry permit. My guess is if I were to go and talk to a lot of public health people, they would think that training might be more important uh, than whether a second background check is done when you get the uh, permit renewed. Uh, but they don't include that. And there's lots of cases like that you go through and it's very arbitrary which ones they include or don't include. And if I can go through and pick and choose what types of laws to include there, I can get almost any relationship. The second, the third point to make is there's a fundamental flaw in that they're making what we call a purely cross-sectional comparison. They're looking across multiple states, essentially over a period of time, but they're comparing the, the rate in each state on average there. Now, let, let me give you a simple example. A lot of people will compare uh, the UK to the United States, 
Well, they'll say, look, the UK has a relatively low homicide rate compared to the United States. They also have very strict gun control laws and very few guns they're on. So it must be the fact that they have strict gun control laws that cause the low homicide rate compared to the United States. The problem is, is that before they had the strict gun control laws, they had an even lower homicide rate compared to the United States. That their homicide rates, for example, after their handgun ban in uh, January 1997, went up by almost 50% over the next eight years. Uh, and so what you, I would argue that they have a low homicide rate for other reasons, and they have a low homicide rate despite the strict gun control laws rather than because of it. What you really need to do is follow lots of different experiments over time. So in the United States, lots of different states over time and to see how their crime rates or suicide rates are changing after they adopt a law and how their rates are changing relative to other places that aren't changing their laws. And that's what we call panel data. And that's what virtually all economists uh, and criminologists use uh, for at least the last few decades. But a lot of uh, public health people uh, still refuse to go and use that type of approach uh, to go and look at things. And it really creates some misleading relationships. So, I mean, I could go on, but those are just three of the major problems uh, with that paper. Sure. sure. Um, I'm curious, what do you think um, What do you think causes gun violence in the United States? And then my okay. follow-up question is going to be like, what should we do about things related to gun violence in the U.S.? Well, I can tell you something that will reduce it dramatically right away, and that would be mm -hmm. legalizing drugs. Yeah, I now, agree whether... 100%. No, pardon? Yeah, I agree 100% the war on drugs is one of the biggest things. That you I've know, heard. people focus on the guns rather than asking why the drug gangs have the guns to begin with. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, if you look, uh, so, um, you know, probably the highest murder rate we ever had in the United States was in 1932. Within two years after 32, the homicide rate had fallen by, murder rate had fallen by 60%. What, what happened in 1932? 32 was the last year of prohibition. When prohibition ended, uh, we no longer had mobs trying to control areas to go and sell alcohol. It had taken away the profits that they had had. Now, I'm not going to go and argue that legalizing drugs is nirvana because mm -hmm. lower prices of drugs are going to mean more people are going to use it and you're going to have uh, other problems that are going to arise from people going and using drugs. Do. But uh, maybe you could use some of the huge amounts of money we're using right now to go and uh, uh, deal with drug gangs, to go and deal with addiction and other problems that might uh, be arising. You know, I, I just give you one simple comparison. You look at Mexico. Mexico, since 1972, has had one gun store in the country. It's run by the military. Guns are very expensive. The, you can't buy rifles, for example, that are more than 22 caliber, which is kind of the, you know, the least have here in the United States. They go and bring in uh, guns along with the drugs that they have to sell. It's not like a drug gang in Mexico can go to the police and say, look, this other gang stole our drugs. Can you help us get them back? Mm -hmm. They have to set up their own militaries in order to try to protect that property. And the same thing is true in the United States. If I could click my fingers uh, and cause all illegal drugs to disappear and all guns. How long do you think it would be before illegal drugs started coming back in the U.S.? If you're in El Paso, maybe 20 minutes. And how long do you think it would be before they would bring in the weapons that they would need to go and protect uh, that valuable property that they have? They'd be bringing them in at the same time. You know, most people don't appreciate that a major source, probably the major source of illegal guns are drug gangs. Drug dealers have guns with them. And so the notion that you can stop criminals from being able to go and get guns, uh, you know, is going to be as likely as you can stop them from buying illegal drugs. What would you do about the gangs? Because this is something that we determined in the last debate, too, is that, you know, most gun crime is, com is caused by gangs uh, with mostly illegally possessed weapons. Right. What would you do ab about the gangs? Because, you know, just ending the war on drugs, I'm not sure that that's... I mean, because oh, this... 
Go well, ahead. if you end the war on drugs, then you remove a lot of the funding from the gangs, and a lot exactly. of the incentives have to exist. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. If you uh, if you legalize them, right, but there's the trafficking of the guns too, though. Well, but you wouldn't need to traffic as many guns if you didn't have to defend corners to sell illegal drugs on, because you'd go to Walmart and buy them. Exactly. You wouldn't. the The gangs would dis, the dr gangs would not have the profits that they have. Young kids wouldn't be going into them, and they wouldn't have the reasons for having the the guns. You have to deal with their profits and what determines the profits. I mean, it's the same reason why when prohibition ended, you had a 60% drop in murder rates in the United States. Right. So I'm looking at the uh, the DOJ. There's a report by the Bureau of Justice that was brought up in the last debate as well regarding the types of firearms, who gets the firearms. And uh, it determined that 43% of crime guns in the United States uh, was obtained illegally on the black market. So that's the largest portion of the crime guns in the United States were obtained illegally on the black market, mostly gang members. So, um, I mean, I don't, I don't think they say mostly gang members in that study, but I no, not in the BJS study, no, but other studies I've seen have determined that it, mo gang members caused most of the gun crime, as you said. Um, well, I mean, you just look at the distribution of murders in the United States. Uh, uh, you have over half the murders in the United States take place in 2% of the counties. And if you've ever seen... Well, that, that's really misleading, to be fair. Well, let me finish, and maybe you okay. can tell me why. Okay. And, and if you look at any type of uh, murder map in those cities, you'll find that the vast majority of those murders occur in about a 10-block area. Those... Over 50% or those 2% of the counties account for over half the murders and they account for about 22% of the country's population. So there, and when you particularly look at the 10 block areas that are there, there's relatively small population that's there for them to have, let's say two thirds of that 50% of the murders that are there. So it's very heavily concentrated in areas that vastly outweigh their share of the population. Getting to the population percentages a little bit more. I, I just don't like the idea of talking about numbers of counties because, I mean, as we all know, there are like tons of counties in the U.S. that the population uh, um, distribution. The, like, I know, that's the mile why I mentioned what the population yeah, was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I also mentioned that you're talking about 10 block areas within even those counties. Mm -hmm. I mean, I assume you're not going to go and argue that the majority of the country's population is in those 10 block areas in those counties. These are not downtown, you know, renaissance areas these are these are probably kind of areas that are more likely to have like gang activity or fighting over right. related crimes whatnot for sure um how do you feel about strengthening uh the abilities of say like the atf to keep track of like who is purchasing purchasing firearms and whatnot like lifting some of the restrictions on that would you be okay with that or are you uncomfortable with that i don't think it's gonna have any impact look we have registration licensing laws in the united states uh uh hawaii's had it since 1960 uh, Pennsylvania has had uh, registration since 1901 uh, and kind of uh, universal background checks on handguns since uh, uh, 1933, where they've recorded information on anybody who's privately transferred or bought a handgun. So they've essentially had registration on law-abiding citizens since 1933 for handguns in Pennsylvania. You have Chicago, you have Washington, D.C., Canada has had uh, registration and licensing of handguns since 1934. Mm -hmm. What you find time after time is that they can't point to cases where they've been able to use that to solve crimes. You know, in theory, if a gun is used in a crime and it's left at the crime scene and it's registered to the person who committed the crime, you could trace it back to the criminal there and solve the case. But what you find is that it just doesn't work that way. One is crime guns are almost never left at the scene. And the few times that they are left at the scene is because the uh, criminal has been either killed or seriously wounded. Uh, and the couple times they're left there, uh, they're almost never registered. You're talking about a few times where they're literally registered and they're never registered to the person who committed the crime. So Hawaii, for example, since 1960, can't point to one single crime I mean, that's kind of an ideal environment. You have an island nation where you've had registration licensing since 1960, and they can't 
point to one single crime that's been solved as a result of registration and licensing. You have Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, in a lawsuit that took place in 2004, uh, said that they said that registration provided some help to four cases of murder or robbery or any other violent crime over that entire period of time, but they couldn't even identify what those four cases were, and they indicated in testimony that they probably would have solved those cases anyway. Uh, Washington, D.C., in Chicago, both in different types of court cases, also have admitted that they can't point to any type of crime that they've been able to solve. You know, we have all these TV programs like Law and Order uh, that go in, uh, or Chicago PD, which constantly use this claim of registration and licensing to solve crimes, but it's just a crutch. They do it because it's an easy, convenient tool to be able to solve the crime within the half hour story that they have there or the hour that they have there in order to go and, and try to solve it. It's kind of a magical thing that are there. But when you actually look at Chicago or, you know, uh, uh, Canada, uh, they weren't able to point to one long gun that they were able to go and, and solve a crime for and, as a result of uh, registration licensing. And uh, they said that there were a couple cases where to some degree it might have helped, but they couldn't identify those cases either. And they indicated that those cases probably would have been solved anyway without the registration licensing. So, and the thing is, it takes a lot of money. So Hawaii, uh, when the Honolulu police chief in 2000 testified before the state legislature there, he indicated that it took about 50,000 hours of police time for Honolulu to go and run the registration system that they have there. If you can't point to any crimes that have been solved, 50,000 hours worth of police time could be used to do regular police work that we know matters and works. Why not use that for that time? We, we know 50,000 hours, that's a huge amount of police resources that are essentially being wasted. I have to dig into the did on this because I'm not, I, I just don't know. But I think like the, the, the philosophical argument would be like, if we empowered the ATF to track things electronically, that it would be more useful and it would cost less money. It's entirely possible though, as you said, that that, that wouldn't do anything. And if it's a giant waste of money, then yeah, ultimately at the end of the day, you just scrap it. Um, I'll dig into that a little bit. Sure. Um, well, you have a couple states, mm -hmm. other states that have tried things. You had uh, Maryland and New York, which try to do ballistic fingerprinting of bullets and create a registry for that. With would that ID a bullet to like a, a model of a gun or a particular individual gun? They would require that each gun be fired before uh -huh. it was sold or transferred. And that uh, a copy of the striations on mm -hmm. the bullet would be entered in, in New York into a computer, where then if a gun, if a bullet was at a crime scene, they would be able to go and match it to the, the gun there. Say so we have a registration for this gun and we have a bullet that when we did this test, and it looks like it matches a bullet that we had from a crime scene. Mm -hmm. And they spent like $20 million on it, but even New York eventually had to drop it because they couldn't point to any crimes that they had been able to solve. Maryland did the same thing. Maryland spent even more money, uh, had an effect for a longer period of time, but they eventually dropped the system because it was just a money pit that they weren't able to solve any crimes with. Is that actually, does that actually work? Can you individually track like a single bullet to every gun? Are they all, is it that unique, that fingerprint? Well, there- I, I just don't know, I'm just curious, I'm yeah. not sure. Look, um, I don't really think it's very good, mm -hmm. but there's slight imperfections that you might have inside the metal. The problem that you have with ballistic fingerprinting is that uh, what's creating the marks on each bullet is friction. And the problem is, is that friction means you have wear on the inside rifling of the gun. Mm -hmm. And so if every time you fire the gun, you're slightly changing uh, what the friction is there. Also, the fingerprint would change over time after repeated right. of the firing. So it'd be yeah. kind of like, right, exactly. Okay, yeah, I understand. Um, so the FBI, I'm just kind of asking questions for things that I talk about. Um, the FBI has a no fly list. It's notoriously hard to get somebody in a no gun list because obviously you can't appeal it in any court. Do you, do you think the FBI should be it? What? 
you say it's hard to get somebody on a no gun list? Yeah, I think the FBI, I think for them to like actually have you put on like a like a no gun list, I think it's like a, it's very, very, very difficult for them to actually do this, right? If they identify you as a terror threat? Well, uh, okay, well, the terror threat is with regard to the no fly list or they yeah. have other types of lists that are there. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing is, the no fly list includes lots of things that are completely unrelated to terrorism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, and in addition, uh, they have let people buy guns who are on the no-fly list. Yeah, and it, they never committed a crime. And any of the people yeah, that's kind of what I'm. Well, because I think the shooter in Florida. Um, fuck, I wish I could remember the case. I want to say the floor, the Fort Lauderdale shooter. I think so. Yeah, the one that people said the FBI. Yeah, was he was he no fly listed, but was able to purchase a gun? I don't remember one hundred percent. I don't think so. He was a security guard in Alaska. He had been licensed in the state of Alaska to do that. I would imagine security guards would have been flagged. Gotcha. Probably. If yeah. he had a license um, there. Do you do you think that you can expand any sort of power to the FBI to no gunless people or identify people that could be potential like threats in Look, the public I, to be a mental I, illness or anything like that? Yes, yeah, I got. I I don't want dangerous people to be able to go and get guns. The thing mm -hmm. is, we got to fix the current system. The current system's a mess. So they'll you'll frequently hear the claim that three and a half million dangerous prohibited people have been stopped from buying guns. Mm -hmm. The problem is is that virtually all of those something around over 99% of those are false positives. It's one thing to stop somebody who's a felon from buying a gun it's a, it's, or a mental illness. It's another thing to stop someone simply because they have a name similar to that prohibited person. When you go and you buy a gun, you fill out what's called a 4473, which you put down your name, your social security number, your birthday, your address, your race, your eye color, and you think they're using all that information. What they use is roughly phonetically similar names and similar birthdays. And the problem is it's primarily minorities that they're stopping from buying guns. People tend to have names similar to each other in their racial groups. Hispanics have names similar to other Hispanics. Blacks tend to have names similar to other Blacks. 30% of Black males are legally prohibited from owning guns because of past criminal history. Whose names are their names most likely to be confused with? Other law-abiding, good black males who may want to be able to go and buy a gun to protect themselves and their families. There's no reason why we should be having these mistakes. Companies do criminal background checks on employees all the time. If companies had an error rate that was 100th the error rate that the federal government has, they would be sued out of existence under federal law. Why don't they have the same error rate? Because they use all the information that's there and they use it the way it's given. They use the exact name rather than roughly phonetically similar names. If the federal government does a background check for you for buying a gun, somebody who has the last name of Smith that's spelled with a Y or mm -hmm. somebody else who has the last name of Smith who's spelled with a Y and an E as far as the government is concerned, that's the same last name. There's no reason why we should be having those types of mistakes. There's, and we could be easily fixed. Just make the federal government have to obey the same rules that, that we make private companies have to make in doing background checks. I've been arguing for 20 years with regard to gun control advocates with this, and they will fight you tooth and nail against making that simple fix. And one of the main reasons is because if they fixed it, then you'd see almost no one's being stopped from illegally buying a gun. That criminals may be stupid, but they're not that stupid to go through a background check. They have plenty of places like the drug dealers that we were talking about before where they can go and get guns. And they don't want it, people to see how much lower. I, I'll give you, you can go and look this up. Up until 2010, uh, uh, the Justice Department put out an annual report on the NIC system. Uh, the Obama administration stopped the annual reports being put out after that. If you look at 2010, there were 76,000 initial denials, okay? There were 44 cases referred for prosecution. Real quick, what did you say the name of the system was again? The NIC system? Yeah, National uh, uh, Investigative Crime uh, background check system. Okay, gotcha. 
And uh, uh, what you find, and I can send you a link to that too, if you want me to. That's uh, good. I reckon. And uh, what you find is that there were 76,000 initial denials, mm -hmm. 44 cases, only 44 cases were refute, referred for prosecution. And uh, there were uh, 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 26 cases were prosecuted and they got 13 convictions. It's 13 convictions out of 76,000 denials. And that's what you see in year after year. And the problem is, is that um, these are just false positives. You know, the Obama administration was constantly attacked by Republicans for not enforcing the gun laws. When Bush was president, he was attacked by Democrats for not enforcing the gun laws. When Clinton was president, Republicans attacked him for not enforcing the gun laws. It wasn't that Obama didn't want to enforce the gun laws or Bush didn't want to do it or uh, Clinton didn't want to do it. People see these 76,000 initial denials and say, why don't we have 76,000 prosecutions? Why do we only have 26 prosecutions? The reason why they don't prosecute those other thousands of cases or tens of thousands of cases is because they're not real cases. You know, it's these are false positives. They would have been happy. The Obama administration would have been happy to prosecute uh, those cases if they had actually been real cases and not uh false positives that were there okay cool um i'm just uh just i'll send you a link to the the next sure. numbers for scheduling something would you be interested in revisiting this conversation in like two weeks so that i have time to dig through a lot of this stuff i'd be happy to talk to you i'll send you the link for the next system report this is the last one mm -hmm. uh that was put out um uh and uh you know, I'm happy to go through all this now or again. Can later. I just interject here real quick? I want to show everyone John Lott's book, uh, More Guns, Less Crime. This is uh, one of his most famous books. You can get this on Amazon for, for pretty cheap. Uh, and then also he has his latest book is The War on Guns. That is another book that you can pick up. I would advise you guys to get both. Uh, thank you both for taking the time today. Um, well, if I could just say... One, one or two things really quick. Well, yeah, we're not, I, I don't know, go, keep going okay. at it. Yeah, I mean, I guess the question, go ahead before my right. question. So I, I just want to say, so not only are minorities disproportionately stopped from buying guns because of the failures in these background checks, because, you know, you have 30% of black males, about 18% of Hispanic males, you know, for Asians, you're talking about 4%. For whites, you're talking about 6%. So it's just, you know, when you're looking within these groups, you just have a lot more opportunities for false positives, having somebody who's going to have a similar name there. But um, you can appeal these cases. But the problem is you're talking about, you know, three to $10,000 or more to go and do an appeal. In theory, you can go and do the appeal yourself, but almost everybody's going to find it necessary to go and hire a lawyer in order to go and deal with all the forms. The other problem with the background check system that could easily be fixed is uh, the cost. So if you're in Washington, D.C., where they're going to be voting on these universal background checks, again, the House just passed a bill, it costs $125 to privately transfer a gun. That may not stop you or I from being able to own a gun, but my research indicates that it's the people who are most likely to be victims of violent crime, poor blacks who live in high crime urban areas, who benefit the most from having a gun for protection when police can't be there to protect them. $125 may be enough to stop those poor people from being able to go and own a gun. So not only do you have these huge legal fees that are being imposed on people for no fault of their own, because the government made a mistake. But then you have uh, these other issues that are here. I can send you a piece I had last year in the New York Times that goes through uh, more on some of these problems that are there. You can uh, link that in the chat there. And, uh, but, uh, you know, look, I'm an economist. And I would tell you one of the things you learn as being an economist is that the people who benefit from some government service should be the ones who pay for it. And, and the thing is, if I am going out of my way to do a background check on a private transfer, 
you know, I'm not going to be the criminal. And if you believe it lowers crime, and I don't, and we can talk about that more, but if you believe it does, it's going to lower crime for everybody, not just the individual who's going out of their way to uh, have the, uh, you know, background check on a private transfer of a gun. You know, that's something that uh, Colin Neuer talked about a lot. Uh, he works, I know he works for the NRA. I understand your, the argument against that, but it is something that he talked a lot about. I didn't know, I, I, I wasn't aware on the errors that were happening. I didn't, yeah, just, I, I was I was not aware that that actually happened as, that much, so. Um, yeah, well, I mean, it's really tragic and there's no reason why they should be having these errors. I the guess my, my, my biggest ahead. question is, you know, you're you're arguing more guns, less crime. Destiny's arguing less guns, less crime. My biggest thing with with the gun debate in general is that and you guys can both touch on this, is that if if most of the gun crime is caused by gangs, we've determined that if most of the crime guns are illegally possessed, and purchased on the black market. We're talking 43%, the 25% obtained from an individual, which is also a straw purchase, which is also illegal. We're talking about the vast majority of guns, only 1% or less than 1% are purchased at a gun show, yet we hear about the gun show loophole all the time. Only 7% are actually purchased at a gun store. And why, like, why is there this huge focus on trying to make it harder for me to purchase an, you know, an AR-15 without a grip wrap or make it harder for me to purchase a magazine with, you know, more than 10 rounds. Why, why is the conversation surrounding the gun and not the gangs? And that was my biggest point, I think, in the last debate. Um, but, I mean, I'll let you both talk about Yeah, that. so, I mean, like, um, I won't speak for John, but, I mean, uh, based on what he said so far, I, I I feel like the war on drugs is a disastrous policy in the United States. There's like a million different external things that are fucked with by that, um, whether it's issues related to the border with people sneaking in firearms or drugs, um, whether it's damages to neighborhoods and businesses, whether it's communities getting fucked up, whether it's our criminal justice system getting bogged down. Uh, the war on drugs, I think, has like a disastrous impact that ripples throughout so many different parts of our country. So, I mean, targeting something like that seems to be really good. Um, I don't know if John's heard about this. I tried to dig into the success of like using like gang databases, like gang registries. Those don't seem to have been very effective in the places they've been tried. I think some cities have started to get rid of them because it just seemed like they were pretty arbitrary in the way they were managed and they didn't seem very effective. I don't know if you heard anything about that, John. I mean, I, I basically agree with you on that. Um, so the, um, yeah, just to answer Vince's question, um, you know, people kind of look to see what the relationship is now but that the, the reason why the reason why destiny's smirking over there is because i brought up the fact that why aren't we going after the gangs instead of the guns and uh his answer and we we talked about gangs databases and how the fbi collects gangs databases from cities and municipalities around the right. country and i mentioned one gang database that the cook county was in chicago they destroyed it and one of the reasons that alma anaya was the person leading this effort to destroy the gangs database one of her reasons was it was because it contains too many people of color on the gangs database now well, that was... wasn't the reason that that was a reason why it could be potentially bad yeah. but the reason they banned it because it was ineffective no like they, nobody wanted to post she it. said and we proved this already she said you didn't it was because you it had... what was no she she explicitly stated this is a racially discriminatory and it okay. has this it this... doesn't matter what she said right. i basically agree with steve that it's not not proved to be very useful or effective yeah that and the reason why i'm smirking yeah, and the reason why I'm smoking is because Vince always tries to go back to like black people or gangs or whatever instead of like I I don't care like ideologically I don't care what prevents gun crime I'm cool with whatever ends up doing it um I'll dig through a lot of this I haven't dug through like I usually just cite studies I I haven't gotten to the point where I dig through like methodology yet I wasn't aware that I was going to be talking to you I thought it was going to be like a like another random person so I have to dig through these to see if your if your points are actually true which is why I'd love to revisit this in a couple of weeks when I've like gotten to read up on these uh, more extensively but um yeah I mean I'm generally in favor of whatever you know, keeps people from dying to guns. And if that, if the solution is more guns, I'm okay with that. If the solution is less guns, then obviously I push whoa, that. Whoa. Um, <laughs> to be a lot more ideologically motivated about keeping black people from getting guns. Or something hold on, something. hold on. You, you, you argued tooth and nail last uh -huh. debate, the last two debates. Well, you're arguing, 
Why don't you accept victory and move on? Well, I'm just saying it's a good thing that he's finally accepting this. I was trying to. Well, I accept everything John is telling me. My problem last time is you didn't understand the difference between, say, like a longitudinal study versus just like comparing random data. Like uh, everything Either that you way, said last time showed like an inability to understand like any kind of data or information. My point John, I was least, trying like, to. I was trying. I could have brought up the scientific studies that I brought up today. I was trying to explain to well, you, no, you in a you way that you could understand, much like Ryan point, Dawson right? had to explain to you exactly what was going on in the Middle East. I, I was know just what trying Ryan to explain has to, to do with this. I was trying to explain to you in a way that you can understand that your argument can't no, be no, correct. No, 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 no. You, you literally don't understand. Your arguments you don't understand can't be works. correct. But I appreciate that you brought on a PhD economist to co have this conversation with me. It would have been nice to have known that like a week in advance. And you're but, being um, educated. This is a good thing. And you're accepting that more guns equals less crime. I'm happy. He's, no, not, I have a he's, lot of he's just saying he's open to talking about it. He hasn't yeah, said anything yeah. more than that. I can yeah. have you guys both back on. But uh, I guess I guess why does more guns equal less crime? Should we be uh, should we be applying concealed carry laws in, in, in every state and city, John? Let me just make a couple points here. One is, I, I think one of the more powerful pieces of evidence is, uh, look at a simple type of gun control law that we've seen across multiple countries, and that is banning guns, okay, whether it's all guns or all handguns. You would think if more guns may, meant more murder, or fewer guns meant less, that those places would see drops in murder rates. And yet every single time, either all guns have been banned or all handguns have been banned, murder rates have gone up. There's not one single time where, where that's occurred where you've seen a drop. You know, people see that in Chicago and Washington, D.C. Uh, normally the response from uh, gun control advocates will be, well, those aren't fair tests because unless you ban guns every place, people can still get guns from the rest of Illinois or from mm -hmm. Indiana or from Maryland or Virginia. And so you'd have to have a gun ban every place. It would have been nice if they told us that before the gun bans. And I don't think it explains why it went up. That may explain why it didn't go down as was being predicted. But it doesn't just apply there. You can look at island nations that have banned guns, whether it be Jamaica or the Republic of Ireland. Or, uh, or England and Wales, uh, every single time that you've had uh, those types of bans, uh, murder rates have gone up. And there's a simple reason for this, and often by huge amounts right after the ban goes into effect. And there's a simple reason for that, and that is you have to ask yourself, who's most likely to obey the law? Is it going to be the law-abiding good citizens who obey it, or the criminals who can still get guns from drug gangs? I mean, we know how hard it's been to go and stop drugs from entering into the United States. Well, it's hard to stop drugs from entering into these other island nations, too. To be so, fair, <clears throat> I was going to say on that, I don't, I don't, I kind of reject that argument philosophically. Like, we can only make laws because using that method or using that kind of like idea, we would literally never make a law at no, all. I'm, not, right? I'm saying you may reduce it to some extent for criminal, yeah. mm -hmm. but if it primarily, reduces it for law-abiding citizens. Then you actually unintentionally make it easier for criminals to go and commit crimes. So the, the question is, is it the victims that you're primarily disarming? I mean, I can believe you make it somewhat more costly for the criminals, but the question is, who are you primarily disarming as a result of the law? Sure, if a criminal is more motivated to purchase a firearm than a civilian, then making it harder for both groups is gonna adversely impact the civilian, which might enable the criminal to commit crime easier, right, essentially? Right. Sure. Um, yeah, which may be true. Yeah. I don't know what policies would have to be like hyper targeted towards certain groups of people, but yeah, I'll definitely look into this. Um, do you have any, I guess, any final thoughts from either side or? Uh, well, like I said, I did briefly listen to one inter one debate that you were doing uh, mm -hmm. on guns. And one of the things that you mentioned was that uh, I think you made the extreme comment that uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, the United States has, I think you said, the highest uh, gun murder, firearms murder rate in the world, or something. I think it was compared compared to like, yeah, that was a that was a long time ago. Um, I, I think that it needs to be tailored to like comparable to other countries. I'm guessing Vince probably sent you that clip because he loves to take that. No, company, I didn't but, send that. Clip, and then like compared to like comparable Western countries, I, I think that's the plan. That well, I, I mean, if you, if there are a couple things. One is if you look at the. OECD list of developed countries. That's kind of the club of yeah. developed countries that are there. Mm -hmm. uh, Brazil, for example, has uh, has a murder rate that's over five times higher than the murder rate that we have in the United States. 
Fewer than 1% of the population in Brazil legally owns a gun, is licensed to own it. Most of those people are police officers. Uh, Mexico, as we mentioned before, Russia has a very high firearms uh, murder rate. The thing is, or murder rate, the thing it, it, you have to understand also is about almost half the countries in the world don't report firearm homicide rates. They just report total homicide rates. In the United States, we're very spoiled by having uh, data on uh, everything with regard to crime. Most countries don't have that type of breakdown. And if you look at kind of the distribution of homicide rates across the world or among the developed countries, the United States is below the average for all countries and below the median. But we're relatively high when you look at firearm homicides. But the reason why we're relatively high in terms of firearm homicides is that the high homicide rate countries mm -hmm. don't report firearm homicide data. And so the only reason why it looks like we're relatively high, and I can send you graphs of this and the underlying data, the reason why we look relatively high when you look at firearm homicides is that you're simply missing the data for other high countries. So your argument is that there might be some country that has a, that um, might have an overall homicide rate that's higher than the United States, um, but in a, in a country like this, it might be more typical of them to not individually record how the homicides are being committed. Exactly. So that's a country that even though more people are being killed due to gun violence, we miss it in the data because of how they account for their homicide rate. Right. Okay. Yeah, I'll look into that. Okay. I think my major argument against that, because I hear that often when talking with people, is that if you look at the U.S., the FBI reports that we have 33,000 gangs here in this country. And gangs to people, we have more gangs to people per 100,000 than any of the European countries that most of the uh, liberals, if you want to call that, call them that, uh, compare us to. So if you look at, for instance, like we have 33,000 gangs and other European countries don't have that sort of gang activity or gangs to people per, per 100,000, I think that that is, is probably the reason why you're seeing a higher firearm homicide rate in, in America than you are in, in places like, you know, Sweden or Germany or whatever the case may be. Uh, what's the point of this? Well, we're talking about, uh, if you're talking about comparing the U.S. to other European countries, is, is what you said. I think John Lott took your quote uh, uh, about comparing the U.S. to other countries in the world and the firearm homicide, firearm homicide rate and homicide rate. And my point was, I get this often when, when people say, oh, look, we have the highest firearm homicide rate in America, higher than, you know, all these other developed countries in the nation, in the, in the world. And... Uh, if you look at the gangs to people, 33,000 gangs here in this country, that's about, you know, somewhere around 10.1 per 100,000 gangs to people in this country versus, you know, all of the rest of Europe, pretty much. It's much higher than it is. Yeah, but I think we already agree that we have the drug country. gang problem. Yeah, it's right. Drug gang yeah. problem that isn't present in other countries. Right, exactly. Okay. So I mean, if you're looking here at all of Europe, the entire UK, Australia, Norway, you know, they don't have this this type of drug gang problem and i don't really have a stance on the on the war on drugs i i can be swayed either way well wait so what are we supposed to do about the gang problem then if you don't have a stance on the war on drugs no i'm just saying I, like i i haven't really given too much thought on the war on drugs i mean are you are we wait, talking yeah, like, legalizing? Why, why do you bring up the number of gangs what should we do about it well the, those are the ones the, the that the gangs are the ones who are committing most of the the fire yeah, so i'm asking you for oughts and you keep giving me is's i understand that we have a lot of gangs in the u.s i'm asking you what do you think we should do about it what ought we to do about the amount of gangs in the u.s i guess i would have i would have to agree the war on drugs what does that uh, what does that entail john as far as ending the war on drugs do you were you would you say to legalize all drugs in this country or legalize well i mean look i can tell you how to lower the murder rate Okay, by legalizing that, I can obviously there are going to be real problems. First of all, if we legalized it, Mexico would be helped enormously. Yes. Okay, the reason the reason why Mexico has the problem that it has is because the drug gangs have to be organized to bring in the illegal drugs into the United States. We'd eliminate their profit. Mexico's murder rate would plummet dramatically, and it would help our illegal immigration problem as well because Mexico would be you know, right. Yeah, well, it improved the economy. You're telling me, I mean, you look at, uh, there's some states in Mexico that have murder rates that are over 100 per 100, 
thousand people. You know, what does that do to businesses? What does that do to uh, people having jobs in those areas? It completely decimates and destroys whole areas of the country that are there. And uh, so, uh, and I think the Mexicans understand it. I've been giving a couple talks down there in the last couple of years, and I think they would pray that we would reconsider our drug laws that we have here in the United States. Uh, but, but there are problems that would arise and we would have to deal with things to deal with it. If the cost of drugs went down dramatically, uh, you'd have more people using them and you'd have probably more addiction or other problems. I would just say, look, we're spending huge amounts of resources on, on drug enforcement right now. Why not consider using some of those resources to go and deal with these other side effects of legalizing drugs? They're going to be there. That are yeah, like there. we already, for instance, spent so much money in our judicial system and border enforcement and and police enforcement, so much stuff on drugs, but we still have like an opioid crisis that we also have to spend money on. Like, it seems like it makes more sense to just collect the revenue from taxing drugs and then to spend that money appropriately on other things. Yeah, now you don't want to have the tax too high, <laughs> because as California may be doing with regard to marijuana and things like that, because then you still create an illegal market that's well there. yeah but i mean ideally like a large corporation like theoretically if because of economy of scale right walmart should be able to produce drugs and pay some tax on it that should still be cheaper than what it would cost to illegally right, right. This, right? yeah mm -hmm. um yeah i mean i've got a lot of stuff that i'd like to research and then uh, return to if anybody has any final things to say yeah uh, no, I just uh, thank you both for taking the time. We can, I mean, do you want to schedule? I mean, you want to go through this data and maybe schedule something else for two or a couple weeks out? That'd be perfect. Yeah, I mean, I'm headed to Germany in a couple of days for a week. So I'll contact you when I get back and then I'll set up another day and we can so, revisit uh, the conversation. So we've determined that more guns equals less crime. No, he's you. determined that he's <laughs> open minded and willing to talk about it. <laughs> right. That's what he's. Yeah, definitely. Wait, I'm actually, you you know, uh, this sounds like a, I'm asking this to, mainly for Vince, um, and you don't have to answer it if you're not comfortable. I'm not trying to pigeonhole you into anything. Do you think that race has some intrinsic bearing on the proclivity of somebody to commit crime, or do you think that's a big thing that needs to be talked about more in the United States? Because I know Vince likes to talk about that a lot. No, I, what, what I've mentioned before, and this is typical oh, of left-leaning people, or pe I'm answering your question. What, what is typical, what I've said before, is that the, the when I say gang members commit most of the gun crime, and then you say, oh, why do you show only black and hispanic people in your gang in your videos about gangs it's not my fault and i've explained this to you already and you've accept this ex accepted well, this so explanation instance, but, i've said because well, the national gang center the national mm -hmm. gang center states that 46 percent of, of of gang members are hispanic and 45 percent are black or African American, and so it's not my fault that 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 that's what. Sure. Pops so something. Up on so in, in all of this conversation, something that John has never done, or I haven't heard him say this. Maybe I missed it. John has never made an appeal to demographics, which you do constantly, and he hasn't shown me a graph of the percentage of people that are killed due to guns in some states next to the number of the percentage of white people there. I haven't heard John do that at all. You do this relentlessly, Vince. Um, that's why I was just curious if, if John had a. Yeah, well, that. Okay. Not comfortable sharing. You don't have to. Either. I mean. Here, here's my view on the world, and that is we have a horrible public school system in these urban areas that I don't think does a very good job of educating uh, young blacks and Hispanics who are there. Mm -hmm. And I think it reduces their returns for kind of legitimate, you know, law-abiding activity, you know, going and doing that. And at the same time, we have this drug war that we've talked about where it looks like people can go and make a fair amount of money uh, in a relatively short time by engaging in illegal activity. And if I, so I don't think there's anything inherent in terms of race and crime. I think it's a lot of bad things. I think we've had the destruction of the black family. Uh, if it were me, I would do things like have voucher systems to introduce competition in schools uh, in these urban areas. Uh, there's no reason why these kids have to be locked into these horrible public schools that they're stuck with. Let them go to the elite schools or something like that. A lot of these states, you know, spend huge amounts of money per pupil, but it's not really obvious to me that we're getting very much of a return. Do that in combination with reducing their incentives for being in gangs, which is some of the stuff that we've talked about before. And I think you'd see major changes that would be occurring. I'm sure okay, Destiny yeah. probably disagrees with you on the, the school voucher system, no? 
Um, I disagree on the prescription, but I think we agree on the problem. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the... if I would necessarily agree with vouchers, but providing better education to people would definitely help in a whole host of ways, especially with recidivism, as horrible as it is in the United States, right? As soon as you enter the prison system, the likelihood of finding a job afterwards decreases, the likelihood of you maintaining stable family relationships decreases, more children born out of wedlock, like a whole bunch of horrible shit happens as a result of that. Yeah. But in the education, I would just say, look, would we want the government to be provide, making cars? Would we want the government to be making uh, computers? Is there a lot of things that we would like the government think that they could do a better job producing than people who actually would have a financial incentive? To me, teachers should be paid based on how good of a job that they do teaching. They shouldn't be paid based on how many years they've been a teacher and whether they have certain credentials or not. Some, you know, I think uh, the way the pay scales are set up to create incentives for teachers in public schools is just doesn't focus their mind or attention on making sure that they're doing the best job. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't well-meaning people that are there. But, you know, take something like tenure. I mean, how many businesses do you have where after you, you work for a year at a place, you're basically, it's almost impossible to fire you? Do we really think that that gives people the right incentive to make sure that they do the best job that they can? I kind of this I don't want to get too far into this, but wouldn't an argument for tenure be something related to the idea that like um, we want professors to focus on their research and not feel like their job might be threatened if they're. OK, well, this is something I've actually done a lot of research on. Uh -huh. And uh, and I think it has the exact opposite effect. That you you think they get lazy and don't do as good a job for research? Well, I, think, I think they do become lazier. There's a lot of evidence that once you get tenure, your research output falls by about half. But. Beyond that, in terms of, so that what you're bringing up is that the notion of tenure protects people for taking riskier positions. Okay, mm -hmm. the problem in is, an ideal that, world. Sorry. The the problem is is that the people who you're being protected from know that. Okay, and so they look at you really carefully before they give you tenure. So if you have somebody who may have different political views, so like. You look at law schools, uh, you know, something like 93% of law professors are registered as Democrats, 4% are registered as Republicans. Uh, if you, you know, you don't want to alienate other people. If you're a Republican that's there, you're going to keep your views very close to your vest. But somebody who won't make anything political for seven years probably isn't somebody who's going to speak out very much. If you do, you know you're going to risk not getting tenure. And so if you were to have instead of tenure, let's say five year contracts, then they may say, look, you know, maybe he's going to do something that upsets us, but maybe not. Let's take a risk on him. He seems like a bright person. And if then you do something that upsets them, then uh, they can fire you. But if it's an all or nothing thing that once they give you tenure, they're going to be stuck with you forever. They're going to look at your political views and stuff like that really carefully in your research to see whether you're going to be doing something that's going to upset them before they give you tenure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Well, um, yeah, I guess I appreciate the conversation. It's been fun. Um, I'll shoot Vince an email or whatever in a week and we'll reschedule something for hopefully like two to three weeks from now after I've had time to like really chew through a lot of this. Okay. Well, have fun in Germany. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot. One I thing, one thing I want to, before I, before you go, uh, one thing I do want to ask you while he's here still is um, about the, the family structure, the fatherless homes, going from 22% in the black community in the 1960s to 70-something, somewhere around 77% today. What What is your prescription for for, for uh, helping that out? And I think in all communities, actually, I think white, white Americans went from 5% in the 1950s and 60s to about almost a quarter, or I think it's actually closer to 30% today of fatherless homes. What's your prescription for fixing that? Would it be targeted at the welfare state in this country? Well, there are a lot of here no, John. Talk about and uh, more than I'm going to be able to get into here. I'll just say generally, uh, you know, I think there was some real problems with the welfare system, the way it was set up, the way that uh, if a father was present, it would affect their ability to go and get welfare payments. Uh, and that created really perverse incentives to go and have the father not live with the family that's there. And I think it had real long-term lasting damage. And it's particularly poor people. The ones, you know, you didn't have the same percentage of whites on welfare as you had for minority groups. And so the minority groups were more disproportionately harmed 
as a result of that than you had for whites. Yeah. Do you have any disagreements there, Destiny? Um, I would have to, that, this would be like another, like really drawn out conversation. Yeah. I think I would still point to, um, I think I would still point to, to war on drugs related stuff. Um, I it feels like oh, being, I have a set of two. I'm not saying. Yeah. I feel like being incarcerated has such a horrible impact on your future and the future of any potential kids or current kids you have. It just seems so hard. Um, people, uh, whether or not people get married seems to be predicated on some level of wealth you've achieved and, and whether or not you've gone to prison will have a big impact on that. Um, you know, like going to jail obviously impedes your ability to raise your child. Like there's just so much bad stuff related to that. But to, to like weight these in terms of like what percentage is because of prison stuff, what percentage is because of this, I, I don't know that off the top of my head. I wouldn't be able to do that. Oh, I mean, look, I agree. Uh, Drug gangs create an incentive, financial incentive for people to join them uh, mm -hmm. because it's illegal. And that draws people. So, you know, women, my black and Hispanic women may realize that there's a reasonable chance that the guy that they're seeing may be in jail for some period of time. Uh, that creates real problems in terms of relationships. It's there and just the guy being able to be around. And when he comes out, maybe she's with somebody else at that time. But you should I agree that drug gangs, it's one of many problems that are created by having uh, the war on drugs. Okay, good. All right, so we will uh, have you both back on very, very soon. I'm sure Destiny is going to come up with some arguments for what was said here today. Uh, I would assume so. Uh, is there anything else that you guys want to add before we uh, close this out? Oh, but I appreciate it. something. Steve, if you want to email me or something and, you know, want something to be clear or questions before I'm happy to try to respond to those too. Yeah. I appreciate the conversation. Um, and we'll, yeah, we'll have something set up in a few weeks for sure. All right. Yeah. When, when will you be available? You said, um, I'll be back from Germany. I think on the 17th, 17th. Okay. We'll talk then. All right. Yep. All right. Thanks a lot guys. Hey John, okay. if you could stay on real quick, just for the end of this here, I'm just going to, talk about your book where, where can everyone find your book and I, I mentioned amazon and i don't know if that's where you want people to buy your book or not but i have more guns less crime and also the war on guns is amazon the best place to to find your book uh, amazon barnes and noble.com places like that are fine amazon barnes and noble.com perfect perfect all right well thank you for coming on and uh and people you. can go to our website at crimeresearch.org crimeresearch.org I and they can see a lot of the things that we've been talking about on the show here. And, uh, um, you know, and uh, they can get links to the books and other things. All right. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for taking the time. And we will talk to you soon. All right. Thank you. Bye. All right. That that was a lot. There was a lot less contention uh, from from destiny than I thought that there was going to be. Um, that was pretty much more of an education class than, uh, Ooh, I'm not sure why my, uh, why my camera froze up there, but <laughs> it was pretty much more of like an education class than it was a, uh, a, uh, <laughs> a debate. There was almost no contention there, uh, from destiny, but I'm sure that there will be next time. Uh, that would be, uh. I'm sure that they'll I'm sure he's going to try to come up with some sort of argument. But I mean, that's essentially my point. My point, my point always is going to be, listen, if most of the gun crime is committed by gangs with illegally obtained weapons, illegally possessed weapons, then why in the world are we going after? Why in the world are we going to try to go after the people who legally obtain their weapons, who legally purchase their weapons? And that. That's my main point. And, you know, we typically hear the, the standard arguments from people of, uh, you know, it's the gun, it's the gun. If we just make it harder for people to obtain guns. And some of the arguments that I made in the last debate were, well, if that were true, then why is there so much more gun homicide in places like, you know, Brazil and Mexico and Honduras and all the rest? And so the response will typically be, you know, oh, because, you know, those those are undeveloped countries. No, those are countries with more gang violence than we have here, more drug gang violence, as John Lott would call it. The countries that have less drug gang violence have less gun crime, like the developed European countries that they, the left constantly likes to compare us to when talking about gun crime in this country. So um, it would really be great if you guys can help John Lott out and, and purchase his book, More Guns, Less Crime. A, one of his studies I mentioned before 
uh, when talking about illegal aliens and, and crime in this country as well was a study that he did in Arizona. I don't have it up right now, but it basically determined the abstract of it was uh, illegal aliens in Arizona were 140 percent more likely, 147 percent more likely to uh, be arrested for a crime than the legal resident in Arizona. This was mentioned in the Hill article. Um, and uh, let me go to the uh, let me just pull up the super chats here and read through these before before we end it. Uh, let's see here. All right, so we have let's see here. Major White Boy says, Vince, what are your thoughts on the thought crime hearing that happened? Yeah, I'm going to have a video out about that tomorrow. That was just ridiculous. That was just more, more our politicians being completely out of touch with, with what's going on. And, you know, uh, even uh, what was her name? Uh, Candace Owens. She said she was like, this is meant to fear monger and control votes and all sorts of things. And that's exactly what it was meant to be. E e Ecomo 56 says, I, in some other language, I can't read that. I don't know what that is. Uh, America only says Vince. Ask the thirty-four. Vince, ask the thirty-year-old pedophile if he will give us his address, since he wants us, since he wants to round up conservatives and remove us out of the country we built after co coming off the Mayflower. Uh, I guess that's in relation to a clip that's going around on Twitter of. Destiny talking about uh, conservatives or whatever. I'll have to uh, I'll have to pull that up. Ekimo says God made man and God made woman, but Smith and Wesson made them equal. Nice quote there. Stephen Thomas says, "Doctor Kill White Kevorkian versus actual doctor." I feel like that was just. Uh, an education process and and many people were saying Vince you look mad that's basically how I always look I don't I wasn't mad about anything I was actually happy that uh, <laughs> that there might not be a potential for uh, destiny destiny to uh, push these gun control platitudes anymore to his audience which is fairly large by the way and this is my whole point about this was to educate Douglas Nowak says, I'm all highway, Rod Farva. Farm Master says, if your neighbors come to terrorize, call on me and I will equalize. Uh, Kenneth Christ says, Vince, do you support gun any gun control at all? Well, after talking with, uh, prior to the live stream, after talking with uh, 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 Dr. John Lott, um, I don't think that I do. I do not think that I, and I, I've been back and forth on this. I don't think that, uh, I don't think that I do support any gun co control at all after talking to him. Because I talked to him about, you know, background checks and whatnot before the stream. And, uh, yeah, I do not believe that I actually, I think that my position has changed on that. I don't support any gun control whatsoever. I think he's right. More guns equals less crime. Uh, Farm mass, uh, that was kind of Chris. Okay. The Swizzler with no message. Thank you. The Swizzler CS says, are you guys adjusting statistics? I think that we talked about that for race. I think that we talked, they, they talked about that. Or we, we mentioned that pod says, can you get Stefan Bali new on to debate destiny? I don't think so. I, I don't think that, uh, I don't think so. Shall not be infringed. Exactly right. Uh, lit one two three fool says love you, love you Vince. Thank you. And uh, yeah, uh, probably going to try to get these guys on again. Uh, it'll be probably a couple of weeks, but I'm sure that uh, Stephen or Destiny is going to try to come up with some arguments against against uh, against what uh, John Lott had to say. Once again, I think that this is a, <laughs> I think that this was pretty much like class in session moment for Destiny. And uh, 
hopefully we'll see maybe his position on guns will completely change um, for the most part I think that uh, the gun control platitudes won't be spread to his audience anymore but uh, <laughs> we'll have to see uh, magic the hardcore truther says hey Vince should I leave Cali because of the illegals well I mean, there's many reasons to leave California, of course. Uh, the gun control laws are, are really making me upset here where, you know, you have to have grip wraps on the AR-15s. And, you you know, for the time being, we could purchase magazines that are over 10 rounds. But uh, it, I don't know how long that's going to last. Of course, they're going to try to appeal that. Um, the gun laws should be enough to make you leave if you're a gun control or if you're a strong uh gun advocate like I am for myself. Uh, many different reasons in California. High taxes, high property tax rates. Um, yeah, of course, the illegal immigration, the sanctuary city laws. Um, for the most part, we've been able to fight back against that with SB, ending SB 54 in a lot of different uh, smaller parts of, of Southern California. Some people are saying the stream is choppy. Not sure why. California is down. Yeah, many hundreds of thousands of people are leaving California. Um, so you may be right. Let's see here. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, thanks for watching. I'll probably try to get these guys on again, as I said, and make sure to go ahead and uh, look at uh, Amazon.com to purchase the, the black box says the magazine, magazine law has been stayed no more high standard magazines are you talking about when, when was this when did this just happen did, was it just appealed i don't know but they, there was a point there was a period of time if it wasn't before but there was a period of time that where they sit you know while it was being appealed to where we can buy uh high capacity magazines don't comply when I left, there was a shortage of shortage of U-Haul trucks. Says Rother, Rother, Rotterdam, Rotherham. All right, so. Thanks for watching. We'll uh, we'll have these guys back on, and uh, we'll talk to you soon.